Bueno, pues vamos a continuar con Hanna Metzaros Martin, que es artista, escritora y estudiante de doctorado en el Center of Research of Architecture en Goldsmith, también en la Universidad de Londres. Su obra se centra en la criminalidad no humana y la violencia medioambiental en el contexto del conflicto armado en Colombia. Ahora nos va a hablar, o la conferencia que nos presenta es Deshojando el mundo, fotografía, ecocidio y evidencia visual, y en el que de alguna manera más eh, afilada va a entrar en, en esta cuestión del ecocidio que apuntábamos antes. Gracias, Hanna. Bueno, buenas tardes y gracias al MACPA por la invitación. Lo siento porque mi presentación es en inglés, pero bueno, vamos a empezar. Ok, so my, my talk is going to be organized into a series of frames, um, and the first frame is called Exhaustion. When I think of earthly exhaustion, I think of the soya fields of Mato Grosso in West Central Brazil. The monocultural fields stretch over what used to be savanna and wetlands, the frontier ecologies of Amazonia, what we know as the lungs of the earth. Here, the landscape of exhaustion is hypervisual. The stripped, bare, bright red soil stretches as far and as wide as our grounded eyes can see. It is a spectacular sight, so barren you begin to imagine that if we defoliated and deforested the whole world, perhaps all that would be left to see would be the curvature of the earth itself. We drive with the windows down, traversing the different stages of soil, soil cultivation, which come, which from seeds to harvest, rely on the herbicidal protagonist of this paper, glyphosate. Driving through the fields for hours and hours, the dust and whatever, whatever other chemical particles the dust may carry accumulate on our bodies. When we ask a farmer if he can feel the effects of climate change, He talks about how the localized weather is now different, how the wind crosses the flattened fields uninterrupted, the sun is more acute, and the dust, the dust is everywhere. I am reminded of the stories of the human-induced environmental disaster known as the Dust Bowl in the 1930s in the United States. Before this period, the agricultural frontier expanded into the semi-arid grasslands of the Midwest, As a result, the soil, untethered by the native grasses of the prairies, turned into dust, which then turned into an eight-year-long storm, altering the ecosystems of the region. Now, I think, in the context of climate change, the dust bowl of this century might just last forever. But my presentation will focus on another Amazonian frontier, this one located in Putumayo, the Piedmont of southern Colombia, where a similar mechanism of extinction through agriculture is at play, both of life forms and of modes of living. Yeah. When I first came to Colombia in 2012, I was chasing stories of aerial fumigation. At the time, Colombia was the only country in the world to use aerial fumigation as a method of, of illicit crop eradication those crops being marijuana, poppy, and coca. However, as I will explain in this presentation, fumigation has very little to do with these outlawed plants and a lot more to do with the land that they are growing on. While herbicide fumigations in the context of counterinsurgency and supposed illicit crop eradication have been taking pl place in Latin America since the 1970s, In Colombia, the practice was intensified in 2000 with the implementation of the US-funded Plan Colombia, a multi-billion dollar aid package, which made aerial fumigation using the Monsanto-produced glyphosate-based Roundup the centerpiece of drug control policy and counterinsurgency against the FARC. It is important to recognize that from the outset, that the nature of counter-narcotics operations was dictated by the overriding goals of the U.S. counterinsurgency strategy. The real object to be suppressed by these operations was not narcotics as such, but the given enemy as understood within the Cold War paradigm. 
Aerial fumigations in Colombia were suspended in October 2015. However, to this day, the total number of spray events, the exact ingredients of the formula, the volume of the herbicide applied, and the geographic extent of the fumigation are still clouded with uncertainty. Information retrieved from a U.S. State Department through through the U.S. State Department, through a Government of Ecuador Freedom of Information Act request, during a lawsuit between Ecuador and Colombia in the International Court of Justice, documented upwards of 247,977 spray events within 32 kilometers of the Ecuadorian border between 2000 and 2008 alone. The lawsuit represents one of the only occasions, to my knowledge, that the fumigation flight lines were released. Um, this is besides uh, to the U United Nations, who they shared the information with. These figures represent a small fraction of what was sprayed over the entire country over the course of Plan Colombia. The map that you see on the screen is a composite of all the maps made by the UNODC during fumigation, um, using fumigation flight paths recorded by the Colombian National Police. The maps extend back to 2002, and each color represents a different year. And so, as you can see, there are ma many of the locations have been fumigated every single year. But I should mention the disclaimer that the UN puts on all of these maps that the areas outlined do not imply that the total area inside the shapes was fumigated. And I would also add my own disclaimer and say that these areas outlined definitely do not depict the total area fumigated, nor do they depict the intensity and the frequency of fumigation each year. One might ask to the UN then what they actually depict, if anything at all besides perhaps the flaws of their own visualization methodology. And I will return to this later. So, however, this is information available to the public at the moment. So this is what I use to make this map. And what is clear from this is that the scale of the fumigation campaign was immense and far reaching. And the long term effects, both ecologically and socially, are still largely unknown. The goal of my research is to examine how the criminalization of non-human life forms, such as coca, has contributed to the expansion into what we once thought of as nature. As outlawed species and ecologies are subject to legalized destruction, eradication, and even enforced extinction, we begin to see how the law continuously intervenes in and formulates and reformulates contemporary nature. My presentation will focus on the visual manifestations of the legally sanctioned eradication of the coca plant via aerial fumigation. And you can see here in this image um, two uh, mixed species crops located in Putumayo that were fumigated in late October of 2014. Images in this presentation will traverse a series of different scales of representation, both spatial and temporal, through which we can read the violence of a human-induced extinction. Within each frame, we find a new story, moving from the ground level and the liminal space between the forest and the field, adopting the perspective of the outlawed planet itself. We go on to consider satellite images, time-lapse photography, and finally, children's drawings. I arrived in Cauca, a department in southwestern Colombia, with my collaborator and friend Andreas Monson in July of 2012. There, one night in the middle of the forest in what seemed to be an abandoned farm, we spoke to a taita who had come all the way from, the Put from Putumayo to conduct a yahe ceremony for members of the Cauca Regional Indigenous Council. We watched and listened as he prepared the thick black medicina. Almost immediately, he began to speak about the violence of the aerial fumigations in his forested homeland. He described the process of fumigation, how it moves through the world. From the moment the poison is released from the plane 
drifting in the air over the tree canopy, seeping into the body of the plant and the body of the human, and how both start to dry out together. This is how the poison shows itself. Is there a sound? Andreas asks, what do the plants look like when they are sick? And the Taita says, she, the plant, shows and also feels as though she is drying up. The leaves also appear as if they were ashamed. Ashamed, desiccated, defoliated, exhausted, eroded, exposed, extinct. Living in the cataclysm of climate change, or what is otherwise known as the Anthropocene, Capitalocene, Plantationocene, depending on how we date and timestamp the origin of the problem, and what was once considered as nature crumbles, we are forced to reorient our perceptions of interspecies relations. This would entail a radical decentralization of human constructed political and legal forums to include what Marisol de la Candena calls earth beings. Looking from the perspective of these earth beings, from the perspective of a plant, for example, the category of violence might also demand a new set of terminologies, a new vocabulary, and an inclusive set of emotions. A violence, for example, which includes the exhaustion of the soil or infertility, where soil becomes dirt and dust, inactive and tired. This exhaustion occurs when natural cycles of decomposition, decay and regeneration are broken. What I hear repeatedly in testimonies about the experience of fumigation is that the cumulative effects of the herbicide give the impression that nature is just slowing down as each year the soil produces less and less. It is well known now that the thin topsoil of the Amazon is a delicate structure, and once it is gone, it is really gone. An agrarian union leader from Putumayo emphasized precisely this point when he spoke to me, explaining that, quote, this is colonization, and he meant colonization of both the soil and the Amazon. And then the, and the reason why so many campesinos have been displaced at Putumayo is that the government wants them to, quote, rupture the soil in order to capture the forest. Then the petroleum, mining, and palm oil companies are free to come in and begin exploitation on another scale. Breaking soil, felling trees, displacing and killing indigenous peoples who rely on the forest. Such forms of environmental violence directed both against land and people were an instrument through which colonialism spread to the depths of the Amazon. This violence can be traced through a series of, co of economies that have altered the ecology of the forest. From the compression of soil underneath the hooves of cattle to chemicals leaching into the waterways from cocaine production, all operate as a frontier mechanism. In Putumayo, the first wave of colonization came in 1887, bringing in missionaries and their cattle. Soon after their arrival, others came in search of quinine. In the 1900s, it was the rubber boom. Then came another influx with the discovery of oil. The Texas Petroleum Company started to explore the area in the early 1960s. Since the 1970s, coca and oil have pushed one another deeper and deeper into the forest. In fact, cocaine and oil development are materially related to each other, as having petroleum industry close at hand means that substances used in cocaine production, such as gasoline and cement, are easily accessible. Coca eradication also facilitates the transferal of land, as abandoned fields often end up in the hands of big oil. It is no coincidence that these two Amazonian economies have grown in tandem. 
Cocaine money is also laundered through a variety of economies all along the supply chain, which have transformed the forest environments from Putumayo up through Central America. So within these new tom terminologies of violence, cyclical decay and regrowth, ways of living and dying are interrupted. We know from Rob Nixon's concept of slow violence that violence does not only occur instantaneously, but rather continues through the disruption and erosion of life cycles, and thereby appears more diffuse and sometimes almost invisible. These terms, which describe a set of actions, might be less spectacular in nature, but are no less violent. The question is, how can these terms bring about new understandings of environmental violence, and within this, its visual representation. And for humanity to be responsible for, these, for crimes on this scale requires a new organization of responsibility, of human responsibility. Just as the creation of crimes against humanity and genocide required a complete re reorientation of our understanding of criminality, so does the act of ecocide. We are living in this moment now, as climate change has challenged the dominant Western perception of our human relationship with and responsibility towards the Earth. And as we begin to think in geological time, an expansion of our previous timescales, our capacity to commit crime, and indeed violent crime, as it were, also expands. Leaves are typically presented as an obstacle to vision, which is why they became a target during the counterinsurgency campaigns in the forests of the Cold War. In 1972, during the Vietnam War, a short op-ed article entitled Defoliating the World appeared in the, in the Milwaukee Journal. While giving an overview of the controversial use of herbicides in Vietnam, the author warns us of the potential for this practice to spread to other areas of the globe. According to the article, a U.S. Army study even called for the defoliation of forests in Western Europe to prevent the spread of communism. Quote, the purported advantage would be to allow fewer defensive truth troops to do more against such a communist offensive. There is a catch, though. To be most effective, the herbicides would have to be applied considerably in advance of the anticipated attack. What if the intelligence reports were wrong? The study that the article refers to is a report prepared by the US Army Corps of Engineers in February of 1972, who conducted a survey of the use of herbicides in Vietnam which had been going on for about 10 years at that point, and assess the need for further defoliation operations in future conflicts. The report is really about leaves. Detailed models and simulations of battlefields were drawn up with and without vegetative obstructions. The report also included annotated photographs comparing defoliated zones to those with high density fo foliage. In the photograph above, we see the rhetoric of scale unfold. There is a certain drama in the addition of the small circle drawn over the forest canopy, supposedly marking a concealed 100-ton ocean-going ship. Performing the magic trick of the diagram, the circle awakens our sense of scale. And that detail of the exact weight that 100-ton ocean-going ship concealed under the leaves only adds to this drama. In the report, the models, simulations, and aerial photographs all demonstrated the impossibility of vertical and horizontal visibility with the leaves present. The conclusion of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers was very clear. The leaves had to go. In Vietnam, unlike in past conflicts where herbicides were mainly directed at the enemy's food crops, the primary target was the forest itself. In the eyes of the state, the forest canopy formed an impenetrable, opaque surface, concealing the criminalized lives that dwelled beneath. However, leaves also operate as a photographic surface in themselves, not only through their own independent photosynthesis, photosynthetic processes, but also as a collective compound image surface. 
Our image of the flat, uninterrupted canopy of the Amazon, made possible via aerial and satellite photography, is a surface entirely composed of leaves. These aerial images form a double surp- for surface, comprising both the photograph and the forest itself. Defoliation can, can then be read as a disruption, a breakdown of the photographic surface that interrupts the plant's photosynthetic metabolism, as well as the surface of the tree canopy. When thinking through the ways in which ecocide manifests itself visually, it's, wor- it's worth bearing in mind that leaves are, in a sense, their own visual representations. And I just wanted to point out this um, aerial image, which is uh, a set of a few um, images um, put together of um, the area of over where I work in Putumayo. And um, these are the last publicly available images um, from the air. Of course, there are more. They're just um, classified. In our expanded vocabulary of violence, looking out from the perspective of the leaf, we need to consider the specific verb action, defoliation. How does it work exactly? The defoliant herbicides 2,4-D and 2,4-5-T, the components of the infamous Agent Orange, are both plant hormone mimicking chemicals. When applied, they cause the plant to literally grow to death. The chemical used in aerial fumigations in Colombia, glyphosate, was first synthesized in 1970. It was patented by the Monsanto company under the trade name Roundup in 1974. Various versions of Roundup have been used in the aerial fumigation campaign, along with a surfactant called POEA and an adjuvant, Cosmoflux 411. Studies now show that the combination of these chemicals increases the herbicide's toxicity. Glyphosate functions differently to defoliants. It blocks the production of essential amino acids needed for plant growth. The poison is absorbed first through the leaves, then travels to the roots, before moving up the stem through the vascular system. This is the same pathway that photosynthesis follows. From these nodes of growth, the body of the plant moves into a state of extreme dryness, Death results from dehydration and desiccation. We can think of violence as as it is organized on three different scales, each of which has a temporal and, and a spatial dimension. The first scale is instantaneous, such as a murder, a bombing, an event with a clear beginning and end. The second is what has been called a structural violence, like institutionalized racism, sexism, etc., The conception of this second level has helped to formulate much of human rights law. And the third is Nixon's slow violence. The challenge with ecocide is to think across these scales because it often enacts all three. So in other words, how can we understand a violence that is constantly manifesting itself across different scales and multiple temporalities? This is precisely the challenge when it comes to aerial fumigation, as the violence of this herbicide is multi-temporal and unfolds over a series of spatial ecologies that unravel from the initial terror and destruction of the, fumiga- of the, of the spraying itself. This diffused movement through space and time, from the hypervisual to the invisible, cannot be caught in a single image. But we move to the next frame which is the garden and the pixel. I first encountered the destruction of fumigation in Putumayo, a department in southern Colombia that borders Ecuador and Peru. Here on the edges of Amazonia, if one knows how to look, you can find a method of planting where the forest and the farm are seemingly joined, the composition of plants reflecting the forest's own inherent biodiversity. These agricultural methods have accrued various names, polyculture, permaculture, agroforestry, all architectures of biodiversity. I will refer to this spectrum of practices as the forest farm. This is a political space whose structural logic subverts the monoculturalized gaze of the modern state. 
The forest farm is in fact invisible through the lens of the state, which can only ever envision the earth in terms of, if, of its future potential economic value as a resource to be extracted. The pixelated image that you can see is an enlargement of a land site Landsat satellite image subset used in the methodology section of the UNODC's annual COCA report. This image is meant to demonstrate the initial phase of COCA field identification, distinguishing between the field and the forest, between COCA and non-COCA. But the point is, of course, that COCA is never alone in the forest, whether or not it is in a diverse intercropped plot, such as the one that you just saw, or if it is a monocrop coca field next to subsistence food plots, aerial fumigation using broad spectrum herbicides affects everything. However, through this pixel field, we can discuss the ways in which new methods of imaging and data production have fed into eradication policies. When US President um, Richard Nixon declared his war on all drugs in 1971, herbicides were already being considered for illicit crop eradication. The United States began strategizing the eradication of poppy crops via aerial fumigation that same year, and they already had the UN in mind to help them with this effort. Founded in 1997, the UNODC has been generating statistics on coca cultivation in Colombia, predominantly using remote sensing data. And these reports um, inform political policies such as crop eradication. But I should also put a disclaimer that the UN does not advocate for this, um, nor does it support it. Thus, the view of the satellite starts to matter. When, the satellite, when satellite images are used in the war on drugs to identify and classify coca and other illicit crops, delineating between the legal and the illegal becomes a question of scale and resolution. And the space of the forest farm presents a problem for this remote view, a disruption of the state's visual apparatuses, which can only see this method of agriculture, which cannot see this method of agriculture for what it is. The space of the forest farm resists identification precisely because of its own inherent visuality, remaining firmly outside the visual logic of the state. The garden cannot be viewed through the pixel, so we must look elsewhere. And just to explain that a little bit, I have this diagram, which compares um, a hectare plot, a fourth of a hectare plot, with a Landsat 8 pixel and a spot pixel, which is a more a highly res... Um, a satellite image with a higher resolution is 10 meters in this case. Um, okay, so this liminal space between the wild and the cultivated is the register of both direct and indirect forms of violence, which have resulted in their steady disappearance. So from the perspective of the state and or the UN for that matter, a question arises. How is it possible to track the disappearance of a space that was already invisible? Referring to the diagram above, a small-scale forest farm plots averaging at a size of 0.25 hectares are almost equal in size to a single Landsat satellite pixel at a resolution of 30 meters per pixel, and, by nature of their architecture of cultivation covered by dense foliage, how could they even be counted in the first place? That is, using satellite images alone. Next, clouds. The cloud can be seen as something as an something of an ecological accomplice to the forest. Both have had a role in obscuring the various seeing apparatuses of the state. According to the UNODC, Putumayo, Nariño, and the Pacific Coast have had the highest levels of coca cultivation. However, these reason, regions also have the highest density and frequency of cloud cover. SIMSI, which is the UNODC remote sensing project in Colombia, identifies clouds to be one of the biggest obstacles to coca field identification, in particular through automated detection. So to begin to understand the degree of invisibility that we are dealing with, um, 
someone I work with named Jamin Vandenhoek um, and myself started to think around the UN's methodology. So 402 Landsat images, um, which are publicly available at 30 meter resolution were collected between 2000 and 2016 over an area approximately 10 kilometers surrounding one of my field sites um, in Putumayo that was fumigated in 2014. The result is the image above. This period of time en encompasses both Plan Colombia and the time span of the relevant report making processes pursued by the UNODC, which began its um, drug monitoring activities in 19, uh, 1999. Of these images, 170 were completely covered by clouds, and some regions were occluded on 210 observation dates. The image above represents the composite cloud cover over the field site as detected in the collected Landsat satellite imagery. Brighter areas represent high cloud frequency, while darker areas represent lower cloud frequency. What this image shows is that there are various levels of clouding and opacity at play, from the ecological to the computational. The image tells us less about the farm and more about the cloudiness of data that has sought to classify the illicit from the licit boundaries in the forest, which are themselves inherently blurred. While remote sensing has become crucial to the ways in which we understand climate, change, the work of sociologist Jennifer Gabries reminds us that down here on the ground, the earth has had its own programs, the earth has its own program sensors. And these sensors are not necessarily tied to human vision, nor to how we conceive of the image. And reading them may, may require a different set of senses, one that demand us to be ecologically collaborative in the way that we collect data, and also in how we narrate stories. This is just to give you some scale of the cloud um, composite image and the aerial imagery that you saw earlier. Final frame, horizons. A world torn in two hangs on a wall in the center of a small house in the jungle. The painting depicts both halves, the world alive, the world destroyed. And someone, a girl, stands in the middle of the two, her hands over her face, almost covering her eyes. She, the author, is a witness standing in the center of the frame. The girl who painted this image was 15 when I met her. She drove me on the back of her motorcycle to the fumigated fields, which you saw in the beginning. When depicting fumigation, the divided world is a reoccurring theme throughout the drawings and murals painted by children from this region. Their drawings are often divided in half down the center of the frame, one side representing the green past and the other representing the dry present. These images made by children are a form of forensic drawing, narrating the evolution of violence as it has been visually manifested in, in their life worlds. Beginning in 2001, Ecuadorian environmental rights organizations Alianza para el Clima and Acción Ecológica began to work with children along the border with Colombia who experienced the devastation of the fumigation campaign. In the early 2000s, when the fumigation was intensified, Colombian planes and helicopters often crossed the border, continuing to spray herbicides over Ecuadorian farmland and forest. On the Colombian side of the border, the herbicide was often dispersed from altitudes that increased the drift, leading to a wider dispersal of the toxin over the border. The goal of the organization's work with the children was to make a psychological assessment of the effects of aerial fumigation in Ecuadorian territory. Later, this investigation would play a role in a case in the International Court of Justice where Ecuador sued Colombia for transboundary harm, which I also mentioned in the beginning. The children drew what they had witnessed and, as a result, what can be seen as a broader coll collateral damage of the fumigation campaign was captured in their drawings. Um, a member of Acción Ecológica explained the evolution of this evolution as documented in their report 
um, when their study began in 2001, the, the drawings were full of color and rich in detail. The only potentially disturbing detail was that it was clear that the children were thinking about the border, which was almost almost present in the images. Then, pigs and other animals appeared to be dead or dying, along with, crop, with food crops depicting, depicted in varying stages of sickness. In these images, the home, a construct which the children demonstrate a larger ecological understanding of, is under attack. The family members are depicted with sad faces, all the while the sky taking up a primary position in the compositions, the source of terror. The pictures begin to change once Colombia, under the Oribe administration, started to militarize the border in 2003. Paramilitary groups began to increase their presence, and in the children's drawings, guns and blood both begin to appear. Then the images almost start to fade. The colors drain from the faces of the people, the plants, and the animals. The human figures are painted without mouths and without eyes, without ears. Unable to witness any more, their world shifts to gray. Between color and monochrome, the world as it was and the toxic world of now, a slice down the middle explains the transition. The border of Ecuador and Colombia, which happens to be a river, the river of San Miguel, is the dividing line. In one such image, each section of the drawing is depicted in a kind of geological layer, with the river separating the under and overworlds. Colombia is set on the horizon before the sky begins, the earth here is pink and gray, gray because of the gray liquid raining from the plains over the trees, some stripped down to be mere, mere skeletons. A helicopter shoots a person who bleeds into the ground, reminding us that over there, across the river, there is a war where bullets and toxins are the weapons of choice. A direct equivalence is drawn between bullets and the particles released by aerial fumigation. What the drawings show is the expansion of violence, of the fumigation, an expansion that leads us to the interior of the mind. Moreover, they are a form of evidence in and of themselves. In the report produced by Acción Ecológica, they, they point out that through, quote, the revision of scientific texts, simultaneously with the arrival of children's drawings, allowed us to find points of similarity between the two. The children drew, um, what the children drew coincided with the scientific discoveries, end quote. The drawings cor cor corroborate the scientific evidence of the damaging effects of aerial fumigation to the earth and to the human body, making connections between the contaminated soil and water, the sick plants and the rashes appearing on the human body, including the children's own bodies. Just as the Taita, who appeared in the beginning in the video, explained to me, when thinking through the destruction of fumigation, the bodies of these ecologies cannot be separated. There is one more image that catches my eye. In the frame, the world is seen from both above and from the ground at the same time, a dual perspective. We look down on the planes as they fly over the border, as we look sidelong on at the plants that grow from the bottom of the frame. The drawing performs its own trick of scale and perspective, leading the viewer to look into two views, both crucial for understanding the violence of fumigation. What we need to, what we need to do is a way to see slower, imagining ourselves from above and being with the world from below. It's my conclusion towards environmental truth. The term ecocide was coined in 1970 by the botanist and biochemist Arthur W. Galston in a conference entitled War Crimes and the American Consciousness. Galston is credited with the development of the primary defoliating component of what would become to know, be known as Agent Orange. But what is ecocide exactly? And I'm not solely referring to the proposed legal definitions. I would say that it is the decimation of these life worlds and interspecies relations that we have been viewing. It is the denial of an all-encompassing existence in the future and in present tenses. 
As we have seen through the deeply articulated effects of herbicides on both human and non-human populations, it is significant that the term ecocide was coined in response to the violence of the herbicide campaign in Vietnam. In 1973, international law professor Richard Falk suggested that U.S. war crimes in Vietnam amounted to genocide. Falk made a very direct connection between the two. But sorry, between, on the one hand, this particular act of killing, and on the other, the ultimate destruction and death of the environment. Just as counterinsurgency warfare tends towards genocide with respect to the, to the people, so it tends towards ecocide with respect to the environment. However, as the subsequent debate about the notion of ecocide has made abundantly clear, it does not occur so solely within the frame of war, but also finds expression in the slower violence of resource extraction, state domination, and other forms of uneven development. Aerial fumigation, as it has been exercised in Colombia, hovers between the two, between counterinsurgency war and economic development. Falk also put, to, put forward the notion that ecocide should be a crime under international law. More recently, there have been efforts to make this a reality. There was even an international Monsanto tribunal that took place in The Hague in October 2016. This was only an opinion tribunal. Monsanto itself refused the invitation to testify, and therefore it has no legal prosecu prosecutorial power. Um, but one of the questions posed to the judges was whether or not Monsanto was guilty of the crime of ecocide. In their advisory opinion, um, they stated that should an ecocide law be added to the Rome Statute, Monsanto could be indeed found guilty of the crime. And they mention fumigation in Colombia specifically. Quote, several of the company's activities fall within this infraction, such as the manufacture and supply of the glyphosate-based herbicides to Colombia in the context of its plan for aerial fumigation on coca crops, which negatively impacted the environment and the health of local populations, end quote. But the law, especially international law, moves slowly, too slow, perhaps, for geological crimes. There are, however, more radical movements towards viewing environmental justice as being essentially intertwined with fundamental human rights. One such movement is the demand in Colombia by activists for an environmental truth commission to be included as a part of the truth and reconciliation process in the post-accords um, time period. The logic of their demand is very clear. Be because the earth has had, has also had been, yeah. Because the earth has also been a victim of the armed conflict, it too must be included in the dialogues. The Truth Commission is constructed with the idea that the earth has its own memory, something that has been made evident, for example, through the work of Paulo Taveras in the Brazilian Amazon, which you can see in the show here. So, one more. Earthly memory, following Anna Singh, is a multispatial construction rooted down into the soil. It is the composition of trees, or through the accumulation of toxins, still actively accumulating, an architecture of chemical residue in water, air, soil, and fatty tissues, trace particles and trace evidences. The war in Colombia has left traces of itself everywhere. And these traces dictate how we might collect. Through the debate around, in, around a possible environmental truth and, truth and reconciliation process, a series of questions which have framed this talk arises. If we accept that the Earth has its own memory, which can take on many forms, how can we visually represent this memory in a court of law or a setting like a truth commission? And further, what does truth and reconciliation look like from the point of view of the Earth? What kinds of truths could a plant tell, or the soil, or the air? What sort of historical memory does the earth have, and how might we read it? What kinds of aesthetics are called for when trying to document and also resist processes of enforced human-induced extinction? And how would this reorient our idea of truth, including evidentiary truth? 
And in Colombia, this is a crucial moment to discuss these questions and articulate the connections between political violence and environmental violence, especially as the political hard right in the country is pushing for aerial fumigation to be reinstated. Further, there's an election pr approaching, and zones that were until recently controlled by the FARC are already experiencing increased deforestation. As the demobilized guerrilla move out, these territories open up to large-scale industries such as cattle, petroleum, hydrocarbons, and palm oil, just to name a few. Already in Caqueta, it is estimated that around 20,000 hectares of forest have been cleared since the FARC's departure. The Colombian government has made it very clear that the future of peace in Colombia is to include that very same economic model of extraction that lies at the heart of the conflict. Feminist science studies scholar and anthropologist Christina Lyons, in her own work of fumigation and farmers in Putumayo, asks the question, can there be peace with poison? The answer, in my view, is very clear, that there cannot be. In order for there to be a true end to this war, we must first make peace with the forest. Thank you. Questions? Preguntas. I'm curious about uh, what gonna what do you gonna do with all this information and all this investigation if you wanna do a publication a project. Uh. So um, yeah, the this is all my PhD uh, research, and the next phase is I'm going to start working for two environmental justice organizations in Bogota and starting to put some of this research to use, particularly around fumigation mapping and forced displacement. I have just uh, some comments. I don't know if you know the, the, the work that Venezuela sent to the Biennial in 2015 was related to the right of the bad wheat to live. I don't know if you remember, it was really interesting, really interesting work. It was like a performance or something from from some women and relating the idea of taking care of nature and taking care of, of kids and being a mother also. Uh, that's from one hand. And from the other, I'm, I don't know, I'm, I, these kind of topics, they're kind of uh, sensitive for me. I'm from Argentina and uh, my, my parents, they have a farm and they use glyphosate I have uh, four dogs killed for glyphosate. My brother with the, uh, uh, but several problems, health pro problems. So I'm just thinking, how can you continue to, I know, do activism in Argentina? It's I think it's very hard to to do it from from Europe. You know, I know that you work with organizations there in Colombia, but uh, I don't know how how can you strengthen this. Uh, actions all over Latin America. I know, I don't know if you know Pablo Piovano, the photographer that he does all, like he take pictures of the people that suffer from glyphosate and how the bodies were like transformed. It's, it's very shocking. And the, the work of uh, Molinari, Eduardo Molinari, that is another Argentinian, that he goes and gets into the towns and he shows how kids are getting to the into the farms because they they show the flags for being fumigated 
so they mark the space or, or where the where the where the plane have to be fumigated. I don't know if you get it. Uh, so I don't know it's 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 super interesting, but I I, I think. I want to know how you can strengthen the the actions with other artists and so on. I don't know. It's more a comment. No, thanks so much for your comment. Um, yeah, the um, the Monsanto Tribunal um, had a lot of testimonies from Argentina in it, actually, um, because yeah, there the the devastation caused um, in just normal agriculture from glyphosate is quite pronounced. Um, as well as it is actually in, in France as well. There was also testimonies from there and also in the United States. So yeah, glyphosate is, is the most widely used herbicide in the world um, and it has been for quite a long time. And there's a lot of work that um, has been done and is being continued to, to be done through activist movements, um, both in Europe and in Latin America, um, to... Um, yeah, basically prove that this is a very uh, extremely damaging herbicide. Um, unfortunately, that, you know, Monsanto, as it always has done, um, it has always um, kind of fought back by producing their own supposedly scientific reports. Um, and it has managed to discredit quite a lot um, that has happened. For example, when, you know, the whole movement in Colombia to... Um, to ban fumigation came from the World Health Organization's report that said that glyphosate was a probable carcinogen. And this kind of, you know, put it all in motion, right? But then, you know, only I think two years later now, um, Monsanto obviously paid a bunch of scientists to make another report saying that it wasn't carcinogenic. Anyway, what um what I hope to do um in my work is just to is basically to add to this documentation that has been taking that has been taking place and thank you for the references um to the other photographers um yeah because this fight is not finished hi thanks for your talk it was really interesting i was just wondering because we i i was late in this session in this talk sorry i have i hate having to miss that i was just wondering if you read because maybe you you, sh you said this you ma ma did make some reference to uh arturo escobar have you I, yeah. be I bet you you know him, you know his work, but I think he's a fundamental reference. Uh, it has many resonances with your, your your touching up on you know different things, and he just published recently this book, Autonomy and Design and Autonomy: The Realization of the Communal, and uh, he's really like involved also in like indigenous uh, mobilizations, human right, uh, nature nature rights, uh, rights of nature, and all this. Uh, ecological, you know, uh, thought. I don't know if it's. Uh, is it like how, how, how much room do you give him in into your research, or in which way? <laughs> um, he he is a reference for mm -hmm. me. Yeah, no, for sure he is. Um, but yeah, <laughs> I don't know how much room percentages. Eight percent, Arturo Escobar. Eight percent Latour. I don't know. Um, yeah. <laughs> Susan? Can you just say a little bit more about earthly memory and how you're sort of imagining that, or not magic, conceptualizing that? Yeah, so actually a lot of my thoughts around earthly memory um, have to do with like my experience in the Center for Research Architecture um, and with forensic architecture in particular, also um, your work, Susan, um, uh, with, you know, the ways in which um, the earth um, records itself, essentially, and it is basically producing its own set of aesthetics um, based on its, you know, destruction. And also this, you know, it comes from Al's work as well um, with the, you know, the, the earth photographs. Um, you know, what you could potentially see from above. However, like, what I'm trying to, to think about um, is not just, like, I guess, a purely imagistic memory, but rather, like, something that can transcend that. Um, because I think it's not sufficient to only think in terms of images um, in the case of the Earth and evidence.
Okay, it's time for break. Yeah.